Does uh, anybody want to drop the first question? Oh, okay. All right, Pastor Angel. So, yes. I don't know if you looked at Revelation 19. Yes. Yes. Do you think that has something to do? Because I've heard people say that eternity is not a time; it's a place. Hmm. Okay. Uh huh. And do you think that has something to do with the fact that there's no night in heaven? Uh huh. That might kind of skew our perception of time. Yes. Um. So here's the thing: is that I do believe in that. However, I still see time as still going because when you look at Revelation 22 verse 2, each uh, group or class of people, they are assigned a, for a certain month or season to partake in the fruit. So then I think that time is still ongoing. But then, you know, if you look at Revelation 10, it says like that time shall be no more. Right. So I think maybe the right answer is this. I think that the current time frame that we're at because we have that darkness, right? We have the night. But since God is all light, we're at a new time frame, so to speak. So there's a new time frame that begins. So I think that might be the answer. But I'll be very honest. There's still more to uncover on that one. There's still more to uncover, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't get me started on it deeper now. <laughs> yeah, but I think there's a lot more to uncover on that. There's something in there. But... It needs to take time. Even me with the teaching, I only scratched the surface. I think that if you study more on light and day, uh, light and then uh, darkness in a scientific uh, frame of mindset, as well as the scriptures, all the verses, you might find some more eye-opening things, I think. I only scratched just the part of it. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, sir. We'll do. We'll do. All right. Sorry, onliner. So the question that I was answering was in Revelation chapter uh, 21, I think. Uh, it says that there is no uh, more night, or Revelation 7, I forgot. But in those uh, two chapters, it mentions about that there is no night because God is the light. And so his question was, would there be something about uh, no time operating? And then I mentioned that Revelation 22, that t time is still operating, but in the sense time is no longer operating because it's our time zone that's no longer operating. But now it's God's time zone. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, to go off on that, God's time zone is very strange. You know, he already said, I am that I am, right? And then during his time, there's no dar darkness. He is all light. I think that we're entering that time zone with him. Yeah, there's something to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so Ecclesiastes 5, mm -hmm. uh, where it talks about like, going into the keep, your foot, keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, so they consider not that they do evil, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, but mm -hmm. in heaven and thou upon the earth. Can you give the verses again, sorry? Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. 1 and 2, yeah, got it, all right. And verse 6. Uh-huh. Uh, uh -huh. right? And uh, is that saying something like, you know, like there's an angel present around us when we're at church? And, uh -huh. You know, because I know Dr. Rokin talks about ritualism there, but can you just expound more on that or maybe talk about that angel? And, mm -hmm. You know? Okay, so I think that it could be two things. So uh, it's think, all right? So I think. So my answer is not always right. So I think what this has to do is this is during the time of the Old Testament. So during the time of the Old Testament, it was common for angels to come down. And then one example is Judges chapter 2. Judges 2, an angel was just present in front of the whole nation of Israel and speaking to them. So at times, the angel can come down and speak to them. And the Lord sometimes, uh, well, the Lord's saying right here, you got to be careful, you know, when you give some kind of oath, vow, or what you say. Because think about it. Uh, when the angels were present, a lot of times God's promise or oath or vow is being commenced. One example is uh, Samson, right? So then the angel was present with uh, Manoah and his wife, and then he mentioned about you got to make sure that uh, he takes the vow of a Nazarite that he don't cut his hair. So then if uh, Manoah's wife said, oh, it was an error, or Samson said that, uh, then you have to be careful of that because God will hold you to it. The second thing is this. The second thing is it might have uh, some application to us today. The reason why is this. Uh, Dr. Upman mentioned that uh, uh, an angel is uh, basically referring to a representation of something. And I 
I believe that more strongly because when I look at Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3, when God is speaking to the churches, he's speaking to the angel of that particular church of that one. Now, why is it? Because it's that angel's fault? No, that angel is supposed to represent that church. So then the angel basically, uh, he's that representation of us. So then when we speak or when we do things, we got to be careful because that presence of that angel for us can represent that way to God. So then how the church of Laodicea messed up in its act. And then God was speaking to the angel of the church of Laodicea. So then Laodicea had to be careful what they said. They said, you know, I have need of nothing. I'm full. Well, they should be careful of that because the angel's representing them. Uh, makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. The Bible says that we, can, we will judge angels, right? Yeah. It makes you wonder if it's possible they can judge us in return at the judgment seat of Christ because there are representatives or they're part of that evidence for us at the judgment seat of Christ. So it makes you wonder, makes you wonder about that. Okay. All right. Do we have other questions? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, in Job chapter 36, mm -hmm. uh, verse 5, it says, Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. And in Psalm 5, uh, what is verse 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that in Job it says God doesn't hate anyone, but mm. in this verse it says he does. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. All right, the easy answer is the original Greek should be. <laughs> that, that's a, now, you notice that when people pull up the original Greek Hebrew stuff, they fool you thinking that's a smarter way to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. But when you pull that up, you notice that's a lazy way to handle it. Why? Because you don't like the verse, what it's saying. So in order to fix that verse, you just use Hebrew and Greek to twist the word and to change the meaning. See that? That shows that you're lazy if you pick up a Hebrew Greek lexicon. It doesn't show how smart you are. All right. So then uh, can you quote uh, Job 36 verse, is it? 18, brother, or can you repeat that again? 36, verse 5. 5, okay, behold, God is mighty, despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. I think from what I notice is this, is that you have to always look at context. When you look at context, it can explain a lot. So in the book of Psalm, there is no doubt about it that because a person is in sin or in iniquity, that what God does is that he hates them. I, he, uh, I know that's shocking to some of you, but God does hate the sinner. You might say, why is that? Because the sinner is a part of that sin. You could say God hates the sin, but not the sinner. Well, that's fine, and I wish that were true too. That way I don't look like a hate preacher, but sorry, scripture is scripture. God hates the sinner too. Well, why? The easy answer why is this, people don't understand this. They separate their sin from themselves. But why does God damn a soul to hell forever? Not because of their sins. Yes, it's true because of their sins, but it's not just because of that. It's because who they are. That's right. When they sin, it becomes a part of them, and they're a sinner. That's why God has no choice but to cast you to hell, and that's why, even if Adolf Hitler can't stomach torturing a person for a billion years, God can do that if he's still angry with you. Why? He's so pure in anger against sin. That makes a lot of sense with the attributes of God. Yeah, if he only, has, uh, if he only lets him burn for a thousand years, something like that, then it's not 100% anger against sin. Don't, make it, don't drop his anger to 50%. If you want to make his love 100% pure, where he died for everybody, and not be a Calvinist, but 100% where he died for everybody, then you got to do the same thing uh, with his anger, with his wrath against sin too. Why? Because he's a perfect God in his attributes. His emotion is absolutely perfect and pure. It is who he is. If he drops a percentage, he cannot be perfect 100% God. So that is the Lord. So that's the definition with Psalm. But in Job 36, there are uh, two explanations. One is because Elihu, the easy answer is Elihu is the one who's speaking. So if you recall, the 
three friends of Job, a lot of what they said to him, some of them are true, but some of them were false too, and God had to rebuke them. God said that he was correcting them. But even if he's right, the context right here is this. You'll notice that in verse 5 and then 6 and 7, it's talking about what he means by despiseth not any is basically when he's showing kindness or a humanitarian effort. So that if there's a person in need, he's not going to despise or turn that person down. How do I know that? Because the reason why is verse 6, he giveth right to the poor. That's the idea. But then it would contradict the first part of verse 6. He preserveth not the life of the wicked. See, doesn't that seem to contradict God is mighty and despiseth not any at verse 5 then, including the wicked? So we can see that Elihu, in his context, what he's talking about, God won't turn down anyone. Like sometimes we'll say, you know, that uh, we'll say about Brother Robert, he has a big heart and he won't turn down anybody. So what we mean by that is basically, you know, when you offer up kindness or a person in need. Yeah, but then if there's a wicked person involved, God says right here, he preserves not their life. Why? So that he doesn't turn down the person in need, right? Because the wicked person might be oppressing that poor person. And that's very obvious throughout Scripture. There's so many verses where the Bible talks about the righteous and the wicked, and the righteous are the poor people, and then the wicked are those a rich one who takes advantage of poor people. Yeah. So then that's what I think would be the explanation that would solve that uh, supposed contradiction. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, do we have other uh, questions right here? All right. Yeah. Ooh, all right. Go ahead, preacher. <laughs> um, an apparent contradiction. I know there's yeah. no contradiction yeah. in the Word of God, but Amen. it's apparent. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 55, mm -hmm. 11. Yeah. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me, mm -hmm. but it shall accomplish that which I please, mm -hmm. and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Mm -hmm. Compared to Hebrews chapter 4, mm -hmm. verse 2, mm -hmm. for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word yeah. did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a very good question there. So it seems uh, I actually did have that question in my mind, you know, but uh, me, it just never, I just never expounded that. Let's see here. So the best way to find uh, the interpretation is usually by context, right? Usually when you read context, then the answer becomes uh, more eye-opening. Uh, if we look at verse 10, Isaiah 55, 10, let's read this. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that uh, goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Let's also look at Hebrews uh, 3, yeah, 4, right? Or is it 3? Chapter 4, All right, thank you, sir. Chapter 4, verse 2. It says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay, so this is uh, my two cents on it. Obviously, when I give answers, it's not 100% uh, truth. I just answer the best that I can, and then you take it home, and then you pray about it, and then the Lord might give you the answer even more. So it's just something that can help. But what I think is this. I think that from what I see is Isaiah chapter 55, God is talking about like in a general sense, like we preachers would use this as a general sense, right? Like the word of God will have power. It will have effect. It will change lives. It's not going to return void. It's going to accomplish its job, its task. Now, when we talk about that, we say that in a general sense. But then when we talk about unbelievers who reject the word and the gospel, it doesn't profit them, right? It doesn't work for them. So I think this, I think that Isaiah 55, Isaiah is speaking like in a general sense, and actually this is very true. God is speaking to the people here that Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, that his word, basically saying his word has power, it won't return void. So it has power, it has effect, it can produce fruition, but here's the thing, it's not the word 
that has no power, it does. That's why Isaiah 55 saying. But in Hebrews 4, the word does not have that power or profits them. Why? It's not because it's the word, it's because of the person. So then the person rejects that word. That's why that word, it, uh, when it's rejected, does that mean it has no power? It doesn't have the fruit? No, it still has its capabilities in the general sense. It has its capabilities to convict, to, accept, uh, to help them if they would only receive it. That's the thing. So then Hebrews 4 points out that's why they didn't, uh, it did, the word didn't work for them because they didn't receive him. The key is not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So then a great example is Matthew 13, uh, was it 13? That verse talks about, see, the word has power, the seed, all right? But then when he gives out the seed, it has power, it has the capabilities, but the person can accept it or reject it. So then the word comes down, the person don't even bother to hear it, Satan comes and takes it away. The Bible says you have to, uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you got to hear it for that word to have its power and its effect to you. And then you got the ground that had the thorns coming out, the grounds that were stony just came up and then died out. Why? Because the faith was weak at those points. The faith was weak at those points. So then if you have a receptive heart of faith, that word has the power and capability. The idea is this. The idea is in, uh, if we say there's a contradiction with Isaiah 55 and Hebrews 4, then what we're saying is the word has no power. See? So then that's why it's important to point out, well, obviously, no, we cannot say that there's a contradiction here. If there isn't, that means we have to say the word has no power. But if we do believe the word has power, then we can explain that contradiction. Isaiah 55 saying it has the power, it has the capabilities, but Hebrews points out the condition. Mm -hmm. And then also say where it says in Matthew 15, 6, you have okay. the commandment of God of none effect. Mm, yes. So tradition and a lack of faith both yes. hinder the word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely, sir. I think that makes a lot of sense. So then the word of God has the effect and power, but then the person, see, rejects it, right? Puts that tradition in place. And think about it. How can the word have its power and effect on you if you don't even use it to begin with, right? Yeah, if you don't even use it to begin with. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anybody, that's a very good question. Uh, Daniel. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who wants to correct the King James Bible. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the answer to that is this. Let's see, so. James chapter 1, verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Keep your hand there and go to Hebrews, go to Hebrews, and then chapter uh, 4, chapter 4, chapter 4. So this is where <coughs> uh, there's a little bit of controversy among some Baptists, but I do believe like Dr. Ruckman that you know, Jesus, he could have sinned. A lot of people say that Jesus couldn't sin because he's God, but then you're going to create that contradiction, I think. Because uh, a lot of them use James 1 as evidence. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man, so he couldn't sin. But then that wording would contradict Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points, what? tempted like as we are yet without sin. Okay, what's the idea here? It's very easy. If you do believe that Jesus could have sinned, why? In his human nature. But in his de the deity nature part, that's what James is talking about. The deity part about God cannot be tempted with evil. That's why he cannot fall for that one. But his human side could fall for that one. So then some people might ask the question, well, then well, what if Jesus sinned? Don't you believe he is present tense God? So if he is present tense God, he cannot be tempted with evil, right? Well, then here's the easy part. He, uh, not the God part, but his human part, sure, it would fall. See, that would be the easy answer to that one. So I think this is that, yes, uh, the, the contradiction would be resolved if you do believe in that. 
if you believe in that, then that Jesus could have sinned in his human nature, then it would not contradict Hebrews and James. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I would like to know how they would explain James 1. If people don't want to believe uh, that Jesus could have sinned, that's fine, but uh, they'll have to explain James 1.13 then, see, that, uh, that God has not been tempted. See, that God has not been tempted. Yes, sir. Yes, so in other words, it's like, the, it's like here's a great example of that, double du that dual nature part. Uh, God says that if you're born again, you cannot sin. Right, right. But in our flesh, our human flesh, we still can sin. Right. See that? So if we understand this aspect, like how God created man in his own image, what did he do? Body, soul, spirit. Yeah. Same thing matches with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That would be, that would be very helpful. Yeah. It would be very helpful to fill in the pieces there. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, sir. Um, just an ex, uh, just quick. Yes. In Matthew 4, 2, as well, Matthew uh -huh. chapter 4, as well, it says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy oh, 16. oh. And then that's a good one right there. Uh, the yeah. The yeah. had to minister to Jesus. Yeah. So mm. there's obviously something going on more than you see in James chapter 1. Oh, okay then. Yeah, okay then. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. He says that you cannot tempt. What's that? So I'm trying to figure that out. That's a really good question. He says you can't tempt the Lord your God. But then obviously Satan, he was able to tempt him, right? So then there's something going on here. I think Jesus. This is what you're saying about how when, mm -hmm. when he became a human, yeah. this made him subject to things. Yes, that, correct. That I was going to say that, yes. Uh-huh. I think the best answer that would make sense of this is our flesh and spiritual nature part, I think. So I think that uh, if we were to say that the devil, he cannot take a hold of us, or uh, that the devil, he has no power to put sin onto us, right? When we're saying that, we're, t we're talking about our salvation side, right? Our spiritual nature side. But then when we're talking about our human nature side, the devil, he can oh, yeah. get that one, right? Yeah. If we understand that a dual nature of the Christian life, we could understand that about Jesus as well, actually. I think it has to do with that. There's something about it. I think there's something about that. Because there's no doubt a lot of uh, how we are made and created today, it follows uh, how God created us to be like him, actually. That's why humans are a very special class of creatures, actually. Very special class of creatures compared to everyone. Why? We have body, soul, and spirit. Animals and other creation, they don't have that kind of uh, tripartite being like the Trinity does. All right. Uh, that's a very good uh, point, brother. Yeah, you made me dig deep there. All right. Go ahead, brother Tom. I forgot to mention the question, too, right, guys? Sorry. I'll mention the question, too. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my question is in Leviticus 6. Um, in verse 26, it says that the sin offering is to be eaten. And then in verse 30, there's something particular about it, but it says no sin offering or of any blood is brought into the tabernacle of congregations congregation to reconcile with all the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in the fire. So my question is, how does the sin offering process exactly go? And why, why does it look like that some of the offerings the priests are supposed to partake in and the others are not? Oh, okay, now that's a very hard question right there. Yeah, okay then. So basically the question is in Leviticus chapter 6, and so let me restate your question correctly. That way I can understand it and answer it correctly. You're saying Leviticus chapter 6, verse 26, the priest that offers uh, that sin offering, he's able to eat it in the holy place. But then when you go to verse 30, it says, and no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with on the holy place shall be eaten, it shall be burned in the fire, correct? Yes. Okay, so then what are the limitations of uh, eating, basically? How much you can eat, what can you eat, what can you not eat? So the simple answer to that one is, if you look at verse 26 and verse 30, the answer is already given. So he can't eat the blood. Remember, blood is forbidden from uh, Noah's time, if you look at verse 30, that's what it is. See, uh, no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought in the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in the fire. So the idea is that blood is forbidden 
Because why? That blood should be poured out on the altar, and it's supposed to picture the forgiveness of sins, the atonement. Yeah, but if a person eats that in his own defiled flesh, it's, it's a disgrace to God, actually. It's a disgrace to God. Uh, that's why it's forbidden in the Old Testament, but it's interesting God forbids it in the New Testament as well. He takes blood that very seriously. The Bible says that, why is that? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and uh, let's be honest, is uh, our blood or our lives is sinful. Yeah, it's not a really good thing. So we need this uh, precious blood of Christ. And then uh, the offering that he could eat is already explained at verse uh, 25 that he can eat. Now, all the details, obviously, I don't know because I don't know every detail in Leviticus. But if you read that whole chapter, it will explain itself, basically. It'll tell you what they can eat, what they cannot eat. Now, uh, the reasons for every detail, I don't know, but I, uh, but I think that each uh, body part, each body part that's given is supposed to represent something. So it's supposed to represent something important to God. So then that's why the Lord will say, you know, you're going to uh, give, you're not going to eat that one or that one because it's supposed to have a significant factor. The second thing from what I recall from reading Leviticus is because the most important parts that are prized uh, within the animal's body, a lot of times the Lord will want that for himself, whereas the priest would get the other leftover parts because God wants the best out of your sacrifice. So think about Hophni and Phinehas. What they do with the sacrifice, they took everything for themselves. That's their problem. So because they took it everything for themselves, the Lord saw that as a disgraceful thing. He did not like that. Because sacrifice is supposed to be basically offering to God. See, what you're offering to him. What you're offering to him. So he deserves the best out of it. All right, so those are the two things that I can see why God would put some sort of limitations upon eating concerning about offerings. What they can eat, what they cannot eat. Because there's no doubt that the law of Moses, a lot of Christian pastors, when they preach about this, uh, they use it mostly for practical Christian application on what it pictures. There's a lot of pictures here on the sacrifice, why it's done that way, the detail, and then the diets and everything. It's done to picture something. The Lord, uh, he's a strange God. Uh, whenever he tells a person to do something specific, we're like, what's the big deal, you know? Like Moses thought, what's the big deal with hitting the rock? Uh -huh. Yeah, but God took it very seriously because there's something that Moses and people during his time wouldn't see. It's supposed to represent his son, and the picture is, you don't strike my son again. Yeah. But when you did that, you just showed that you disgraced my son again. You know what the Catholic Mass is? Striking Jesus again. That's what it is. Striking Jesus again, that he's sacrificing again, a continual sacrifice. No, God says, no, it's just one time one time. There's no doubt pictures are important. I think it was Hosea or Amos. The Bible talks about that similitudes or pictures. They're very important to God. Pictures are extremely important. A lot of Bible believers, they're afraid of figurative interpretation, which I understand. You have to take the Bible literally, every word for word. But don't let it go off balance where you denounce the figurative. Because the figurative is very important to the Lord. It's supposed to picture, represent some deeper meaning in there. There is some truth into that. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, do we have uh, another question? Uh, Brother Ralph. Uh -huh. I saw your hand, brother. I'm going to go to you. <laughs> You're not running away. All right, go ahead, Ralph. What happens when we confess our sins? Like, what happens to our sins when we confess it? Oh, I see. What happens to our confession? Yeah, so then, like, basically what happens... Uh, at that moment, like what actions take place, or is it our sin? Yes. Okay, then, the first one. Okay, then. So then, when we confess our sin to the Lord, one, based off of Romans chapter 8, we don't even pray correctly, see? So then, because of, yeah, I believe that. We don't even pray. Yeah, even, even confession or thanking, we can't do things correctly. So then the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf, and then the Holy Spirit will show you know, the right words on what he's saying, you know. So, for example, I might be sorry about my bitterness, right? But then the Holy Spirit could show a deeper meaning. It's deeper than his bitterness, Lord. Yeah. So then maybe sometimes the Holy Spirit would do that. Um, so the Holy Spirit translates for us, one. Number two, Jesus Christ takes that prayer request based off of Romans chapter 8 
and then gives that translation to the Father. He's our intercessor, our high priest. Now, what did the high priest do with the people's sins? When they were confessing it to the Lord, he had to be that intercessor in place. So Jesus Christ is that intercessor. And then the Father, what he does is that he cleanses it away with his blood. Because of 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Now, the question obviously is, well, isn't the, or, didn't his blood already wash away our sins at Calvary? Isn't it talking about our salvation? All our sins are washed away, past, present, and future. Well, the problem with that is this, is that when you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the cleansing of the, of the blood, cleansing our sins, is based not on our salvation, but our current fellowship. So John is including himself as a believer. So he's saying, I can still receive that cleansing. All right. Well, then, uh, then what happened to our sins when we got saved? That's based uh, not on your fellowship, but on your salvation. All right, why, is there, why would God have two different blood cleansings for salvation and fellowship. Simple, because with uh, your salvation is based on your soul. See, so no matter how many times your body sins, your soul is still purified. So that blood of Jesus Christ covered all the sins of the soul, but not your body. Because if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, about the judgment seat of Christ, for, uh, uh, for God shall bring, uh, let's see, it was, uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done whether it be good or bad. Yeah. See, so then what God's judging uh, you at the judgment seat of Christ is your flesh. Why? Sin has to reap what it sowed in the flesh. It has to. See that? So then uh, the judgment seat of Christ is one of them. So then at the judgment seat of Christ, he's judging you for your fellowship. Why? Because it's based on how well you behaved in your body. What's the evidence for that? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about the judgment seat of Christ, but the last verse talks about how well you took care of his temple, the body. So the body is all connected to that. See, So that's what happened uh, when you confess your sin to God. When you confess your sin to God... The Holy Spirit uh, conveys uh, the deeper emotions, the real meanings, the whole, and then the Lord Jesus Christ intercedes on your behalf to the Father. The Father cleanses it away with his blood, and then at the judgment seat of Christ, it is said, I'm not sure, but it's, the verse is kind of plain, I think it's wiped clean. So now at the judgment seat of Christ, God won't be able to judge you for those things. So because 1 John 1, 7 is plain, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And that's based on our fellowship. So uh, it is said that me, I'm, I'm not, I don't teach that as 100% truth because I always err on the side of caution. But that seems to strongly point out that way. Yes. Would there be like a heavenly tabernacle with all the sacrifices as well? Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, the thing is, well, there is, a, there is a temple up in heaven, you know. I don't know about Jesus Christ uh, dressing up as a high priest uh, literally and doing all that but i wouldn't be surprised the reason why is this because if you look at revelation uh chapter 16 there is still that ceremony going on there about the sacrifice the incense going on and the lord's taking up the incense which are the prayers of the saints so if that's how prayer works where G there, you have a high priest who's interceding and then uh, an incense where it takes up the prayers on the altar makes you wonder that it could be like that in their Christian walk. If a person believes in that, I have no problem with that. Because if you look at Hebrews 13, it talks about when we're giving uh, our praise, it's, it's called a sacrifice to him. It's called an offering to him. The uh, Bible talks about Romans chapter 12 that the way we live in our life is a living sacrifice. Yeah. But then again, then again, there could be a fault to that. The fault is, is that God's priesthood and the way he works and operates his, his tabernacle is not physical objects and things. And the evidence was when he cut that veil in half and went up to heaven. So everything is more of a spiritual operation. See that? So instead of like a, you know, physical sacrifice where you put up a lamb and something like that, it's more of your action. See, you're spiritually how you live. That's considered as a sacrifice to God. So you have to consider all these options. Yeah. So it could be going on or it may not be going on. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 
This is Berkeley, you know. I'm just used to <laughs> calling them by different pronouns now. <laughs> 6 Corinthians um, 11, mm -hmm. 31, it, it says, we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Yes. That is a very, very good question. I think that you used a verse that can really support that. I think that verse can really support that because um, if we were judge ourselves, we would not be judged. How do you judge yourself? This is a verse we use against hyper-dispensationalists. Uh, hyper-dispensationalists, who they are is any other verse you use, like 1 John 1 that I used, you confess your sin and God can cleanse it. They don't believe in that. They'll say, no, that's for tribulation saints. They only use Paul's epistles and they will die on the apostle Paul. Paul is their Jesus Christ who died on the cross for them. So then they'll always go by Paul, Paul, and Paul. Uh, but then in Paul, when he's talking about 1 Corinthians 11, we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged, then how is the person judging himself, right? So obviously when the person is judging himself, he's already saying, oh, this is, what is judgment? You're pointing out what is wrong and you're making a confession. Is that, isn't that how judgment works? There's a confession involved, there's an investigation on the matter, there's a confession on the guilt. See that? And then even in judgment, there's a plea for pardon. See? So then the person is supposed to do that himself. If we were to do that, then we would not receive judgment from, from the Lord. So I think that can very much support the idea about the importance of confessing sins so that it won't be brought up at the judgment seat of Christ. All right. Yeah, that's a really good verse. Brother, I'm so sorry. I, I skipped you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I know this is a touchy. That's okay. That's, that's okay. I'll do what I can. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> anyway, tattoos. I heard of tattoos. Ah, yes, tattoos, yeah. No, oh, that's not a touchy subject. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, it once said that uh, they're okay as long as they're not evil. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I don't agree. I don't agree with that one. No, I don't agree with that one. So the reason why I think tattoos are wrong, so a lot of people will use Leviticus. I don't know if you've seen them use that before, about not putting markings on your skin. But to be honest, that's not my basis. You know, it's not that verse. Because the argument against Leviticus is not printing markings is they'll point out other verses like not having mixed fabric, for example. But we all do that, see? So then the way they argue around that is, well, that's Old Testament. Now, how I, uh, and also in that passage, they mention about, you know, not cutting the hair. But 1 Corinthians 11 talks about you got to cut your hair. So that's why I don't really use Leviticus. This is uh, very eye-opening for people, okay? So you, from California, California is known for being a very worldly church. I don't know if you knew that, okay? We have, uh, we have all the garbage that you can think about. Any apostate pastor, it's all here in California, okay? So you talk about Trinity Broadcasting Network, Benny Hinn's home and mansion where he's at. You talk about Hillsong in Hollywood going on. And then you talk about Rick Warren, you talk about Crystal Cathedral, was from Robert Schuller, and then uh, Greg Laurie Harvest, and everything, everything you can think about, it's all in California, okay? So we had this huge issue in our church, obviously, and then the people who started in our church knew that. How I teach them is this. One thing I notice about the Bible is he does not give specific dress codes. He doesn't say that uh, wear a tie, don't wear a tie, etc. Because the reason why is every person from every different cultural time period is different how they dress. So today we would say that, uh, you know, hey guys, you know, uh, you, you got to wear pants, not skirt, because, you know, it's, it's like, like something feminine. But then if you go to Scotland, they have that. And then if you go to the Old Testament, that was normal for them. See? So, but some IFP people go so far that... <laughs> They say, well, Jesus never wore a skirt. He wore pants, you know. They, they go that far, you know. So that one's just too much. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You're just really going for dressing with the IFB style. God does not go by IFB style of dressing. All right? That's why you'll notice about Bible believers. Uh, actually, a lot of Bible believers, when they preach, they actually, believe it or not, criticize about, you know, all you preachers talk about is dressing. Why don't you... Uh, aim toward their heart, and then their outward appearance can change. Yeah, because that's a legalism rule thing among IFP churches. Now, uh, how that's the key is the heart. So then, 
whether you believe it or not, there's a reason why you chose to dress and fashion yourselves that way. Dressing is not just, hey, I wear it, that's it. No, people don't just wear it to wear something warm. There's something in their heart why they chose it. See, if you st uh, fashion is part of art. And in higher ed, art is all about your taste, your desire, what's in your heart's emotion. See that? So then God aims for that. And I believe this is how I teach it. It's, there are four ways how God designs it for dress codes. And it's all aiming toward the heart. One is uh, God, he, he hates uh, immodest apparel. Basically, apparel that uh, causes lust. See? So then, see, that's why then you'll see how preachers are not, you know, big about mini skirts or, you know, the women having short shorts and stuff like that. And guys now wearing that. Can you believe that now? You know, it's just, we live in a messed up world. So then, so then, the, uh, the, so then if you know that in your heart, you know why you wore that. I mean, it's so obvious. In winter, in California, I see women dressing up like that, and they do it for a reason, see? Not because they're too hot, you know? So, uh, second thing is uh, God hates universal appearances. Even in the Old Testament, even though they all wore skirts, the Bible says that the man and the woman, there has to be a distinguishing. Even in the New Testament, God makes that distinguishing. That's why he makes that distinguishing with the hair, See, God wants, does not want universal appearance. There is no doubt once we, if you study fashion history, you'll automatically know why people dress up like that and its history is bad. So that's a side note. This is not scripture, but study the history of why they start out that fashion and why it's these people now who are in charge of your modern fashion now and why people are picking that trend. So you're letting these guys, these little Tweeties over here, uh, dictate. I, I never said anything, YouTube, okay? I just said Tweety birds, okay? <laughs> so these little Tweeties right here, that uh, they're going to dictate how you dress. See, they're changing our culture, our thinking. Yeah, See? So then uh, uh, the universal apparel, if you study that history, there is a reason why it came out to a more universal trend for a reason. And then the third thing is punk fashion. Now, believe it or not, if punk fashion, what punk means is basically rebel, worldly. A lot of people, when they dress up like goth or then have all these piercings, it's done for a reason. And even psychologists admit it, it's, uh, it's a rebellious mindset, basically. It's a rebel mindset. So then they knew that trend, they called it punk fashion. Well, look at the list of punk fashion, how they dress. See, then you pretty much know. Is the Bible for punk fashion? No. The Bible says in uh, Ephesians that we are to put on the spiritual things and not on rebellion, actually, or the things of this world. So there's a scripture on that one. The fourth thing, all right, now, uh, some, uh, now I'm not saying you have to wear a tie in uh, our church. Personally, I believe you should if you're going to preach on the pulpit. But anyway, the point is, is that uh, everyone's taste will be different on this. If you make it simple, casual versus formal dressing. Yeah, it's found in the book of Genesis and the book of 2 Samuel. When Jacob went to worship the Lord, he says that don't wear your normal clothes, put on some special clothes. That's why I believe, you know, wearing a tie. But if I'm like in a different country where, you know, tie is not the norm there, then what's their fashion on special garment, I would wear that. See that? Uh, so that's why God doesn't go by specific details of dressing. Why cultures are all different from their heart. So God goes by their heart. Uh, but then you get Calvary Chapel, you know why they dress like that. You go to the typical uh, worldly churches today, you know why they allow the uh, preachers who are 45 dressing up like 18. Yeah, so you know why they're doing that, because it's the norm of the world, you know, it's the rat of the world. No, 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 God doesn't want that. When you come to worship him, you change it to a special garment. What is special garment? Everyone has common sense, okay, is that uh, if uh, pe people go to, s even lost people know this, when they go to a graduation ceremony, they know what they're going to wear. Yeah. Why is it that the wicked world all of a sudden wear a tie during like, High school prom or Hollywood? 
but, uh, but they don't do that for church. See that? There's a reason. It's all because it's a special event. And ambassadors, the reason why they dress like this serious, it's done for a reason. It's not because it's a norm. It's to represent the serious tone of, that they're representing their country, their leader. That's why you'll see Christians, as much as I don't like this choking my neck and stuff like that, uh, it, why, why I put this on is because I'm representing as an ambassador for my heavenly country, how I think about my king. See, that's why we dress like this. So those are the four rules. That should cover everything pretty much, actually. Yeah. Uh, yes. For the casual and formal yeah. clothes. Yeah, so then let's look at that, okay? Let's look at Genesis, okay, and 2 Samuel. Even David, he was in mourning. He, his child died, but when he went to the house of God, he changed. Yeah, he wasn't in his ordinary clothes, you know. He wasn't in his pajamas like some people would come to church nowadays, right? He was like, no, this is church, this is serious, I'm going to start changing. All right, go to Genesis, and that is chapter 30, let's see here, 33, uh, 35, 35, Genesis 35. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel 12, and then uh, Genesis 35. Now look at this, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and what? Change your garments. So he's saying, no, your casual everyday clothes you're wearing right now, no, that's not going to be good. You need to change it. Why? Because it's very special. Look at verse 3. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress. He's going to, quote, unquote, church, see? Worship service. When you're worshiping the Lord, then that's why it's common in church worship, we change, see? Look at 2 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, and then uh, we'll look at verse 20, verse 20, thank you. Then David arose from the earth and washed, anointed himself, and changed his apparel. So he's not in his casual clothes, what's casual to him? What's comfortable to him? No, he changed it and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He was going to go to a serious worship service, so obviously he's going to change his apparel and put on serious clothes. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Uh, a good example is we have a brother in our church. I quite mention him often, but Big Chuck, some of you, uh, my members know him. He was very special in my heart, and uh, he... He prayed for just for this pastor at least one hour a day, just for this pastor. Um, that brother, he couldn't wear a tie. You know, he, he was, had this uh, uh, PTSD and all these other issues, so then he would have breathing issues and all that. So then what he, uh, and then the collar, there's no way he could do that. So then what he did was he would wear his best T-shirt. So he t put on his best T-shirt and came to church. Now, if he was in a typical um, IFB type of church and they saw that, then they would say that he probably sinned. But that's not how God goes by. He doesn't go by Mormon Amen. dress code Amen. rules. Yeah. He goes by your heart. Amen. See? He goes by your heart on that one. So that's why it's very important to do that. Okay, I think, let me look at what time it is. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to end it here. So, uh, sorry. Sorry about it, guys. It's 9-11, all right? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer, okay? Uh, Father God, uh, thank you so much for an enjoyable time. What a warm-up to the blowout. I know that uh, we're going to have even more fun. And uh, may you speak to us in the coming meetings, and may we have a great time, but mostly glorify you and edify each other and get our lives changed for the better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.